Hello and welcome to my podcast, What I Find Funny. My name is Deb Sherritt, and I'm so happy you've stopped by for another anecdote from my life that I found funny and hope you do as well. Not all life experiences are funny per se. Sometimes they're quirky, strange, or coincidental, which, in my humble opinion, all fall under the funny umbrella. So, sit back and take a few minutes with me while I tell you all about my great Auntie Tilly. In order for you to fully appreciate the great Auntie Tilly experience, I need to fall into my other persona, which is a Northern English woman, complete with accent. For some reason, I can't seem to talk about my family without becoming a Lancashire girl again. And although I was only one year old when we immigrated to Canada, the Northern English accent was thick as fog in my childhood home. I wasn't sent to daycare or any kind of early schooling. Oh no, I spent my days with my nana and mum until I started kindergarten when I was turning five. I tell you this because many people would say my accent was fake, but I can assure you this is as comfortable on me as a pair of old knickers. Now, great Auntie Tilly was my maternal grandmother's sister. My mum's mum stayed in England when we emigrated, and I only met her a couple of times in my younger years. She died when I was 15. So, when I travelled to England when I was 16, I met great Auntie Tilly. And although we called her Auntie Tilly, she deserved every ounce of that great part. She began every tale with, I was born in 1908, which meant you were in for a long story. And God forbid you asked her a question while doing anything. I once asked her something while hand-washing the dishes and she dried for me. She stopped mid-dry to tell me the answer and held on to the dish the whole time. Another time she stopped in the middle of a Manchester crosswalk to answer something I'd asked and a bus was heading straight for us. She held my arm firm and told me that the bus would not run us over and would have to wait until she had done speaking. A real force to be reckoned with. Auntie Tilly didn't like doing two things at once, especially if she was speaking. She wanted to give you her full attention and make sure she had yours, no matter what. She'd even go so far as to rest her hands on yours to stop you from continuing with working while she spoke. Auntie Tilly knew when she had an audience and literally how to keep them. She stood all of four foot ten, and in order to compensate for that, she wore very thick and chunky high heels, bringing her up another few inches. But once she took those heels off, you wondered where she went. She may have been tiny, but her personality was larger than life. Having never had children, Auntie Tilly doted on her many nieces and nephews. She was very close to my mum's sister, Anita, and Auntie Tilly stayed with us when I visited Anita in my teens. It was lovely to get to know her, and boy, could Auntie Tilly tell it to you straight. She had a lovely way about her, which made it so that she could tell you where to go, and you'd actually pack for the trip. She was no fool and whip-smart, especially at banking and investing. She would lament some days about back when she'd go into the banks and the respect she received. High praise for a woman back in those days. She taught herself many things that most women wouldn't think of doing at the time and wasn't dependent on anyone, even when she married. She was a singular woman and one I was proud to be related to. I visited England again when I was 22 with my mum and dad. Again, we stayed at Anita's, but it was a different visit altogether. My eldest cousin, Simon, who was just shy of 17, hung out with me all the time I was there. He introduced me to some of his older mates and was able to sneak a pint in the pub every now and again as his parents worked in the pub and all knew Simon was a good lad, so they turned a blind eye to a 17-year-old having a pint. I enjoyed spending money on him and on one particular night, Simon and I got very heavily inebriated. We walked home arm in arm promising that we'd always be best mates. It was the best night of my trip. (laughs) I awoke the next morning with the kind of hangover that makes you swear off ever drinking again. When I saw Simon's face, I knew he didn't feel much better. I was hoping we'd just stay in that day as our visit had been very fast-paced. We'd been on the go each day and I was ready for a rest day, but Mum had other plans. 
She wanted us to visit Auntie Tilly. Since I'd last visited as a teen, Auntie Tilly had moved in with her elder sister, Eva, another great auntie to me, and although I was thrilled at the prospect of seeing Auntie Tilly and meeting Auntie Eva, all I wanted to do was die. But that didn't happen. I managed a shower and a hair and makeup application and stepped into the loveliest dress I had brought in hopes to appease my mum's death stare she gave me every time I moaned or groaned. I may have felt like dirt, but I managed to look half decent for a visit with the great aunties. The car ride wasn't fun. They lived in the next town over, so we all crunched into the back of Anita's car to make the trip. English cars are anything but roomy. It was a very warm June day, and being stuffed in the back of the car was gruelling. I was extremely hot, stuffy, and was making my hungover even worse. Simon cracked his window a bit and I was grateful for the fresh air. I honestly don't know how I managed to keep it together and I was relieved the car ride was done when we pulled into their drive. The two great aunties lived in what's referred to as a manor house. Very large rooms, solid wooden floors, polished to perfection with tiny area rugs scattered here and there. Death trap in the making for old aunties wearing high heels. Auntie Tilly came to the door to greet us. It'd been a few years since I'd seen her and she was even smaller in stature, almost like she was shrinking, and I noticed something else about her. Her makeup was applied ten degrees askew. It looked as though if you tapped her lightly on the left side of her head, her makeup would then line up with her face. She looked older and more frail. I also noticed something else on this very warm June day. She was wearing a thick wool cardigan over top of her wool dress and stockings. Just looking at her made me feel flush and I immediately started sweating. We all piled into the front living room which faced south, meaning the sun was blazing in through the windows and onto the back of my head where I was sitting on the settee. The two aunties busied themselves getting tea and sandwiches made for us and when they both came back into the room, they were carrying large silver trays filled with food, teacups, plates and spoons. Auntie Tilly sat the tray down in front of Simon and I and left the room. Neither of us could tolerate the thought of food or tea and just hoped the visit wouldn't last much longer. Back came Auntie Tilly, this time carrying a silver tray with a large bottle of champagne and a number of champagne glasses. By this time, the heat of the sun was making the very large room seem very small, almost claustrophobic, and I wished I'd worn something loose and comfortable. Auntie Tilly asked my dad to start a fire, a coal fire as she was feeling a bit chilly. Chilly? There was absolutely nothing chilly about that room and the thought of a fire ranging in the fireplace had me feeling very uneasy. Auntie Tilly took one look at me and knew straight away what was wrong. Had a night out last night, did you? She asked me. I could barely acknowledge her question, was worried if I nodded my head it would cause my stomach to roil again. Auntie Tilly wasted no time, popped the cork on the champagne, filled two glasses and handed them to Simon and me. The last thing I wanted was alcohol, and even at the best of times, I hated champagne. It's twelve-year-old champagne, she told us. Get that into you and you'll be right as rain. She poured glasses for the others in the room and then raised a glass high and said, Here's to the hair of the dog that bit you, and to my complete surprise, drained a glass. Reluctantly, but with all eyes on us, Simon and I both mumbled the toast and drank. Well, the effect was almost instantaneous. With one sip of that twelve-year-old champagne, my headache, my bad stomach and the feeling of the room being too close was completely gone. I'm not exaggerating in the least. That champagne took my hangover away and had me feeling absolutely fine in less than the time it took to pour the glass. It must have shown on my face because right away Auntie Tilly was giggling to herself with a knowing look. When you've lived as long as I have, you know how to fight fire with fire. Oh, and speaking of which, can you throw more coal on the fire? I still feel chilly. Ha! Huh! 
I laughed. <laughs> Keep drinking that champagne and you won't, I told her. And that's what I find funny. I appreciate you joining me for this episode. Be sure to leave me your comments and hit that like button and share with your family and friends. This podcast can be found on Podbean, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the sites you look for for podcasts. Follow me so you're notified when new episodes are dropped. And most importantly, you find funny where you can and take care.